Yes. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Good Gram Show with me, Chris Goodram. Okay, so today's question uh, that I'm posing is, as whiskey drinkers, have we become too... Yes, have we become too meow? <laughs> no, we haven't. Come on. Um, no, the question is, have we become too elitist? Too elitist, too snobby um, with regards to you know how we choose and what whiskies we choose to purchase and what we choose to drink. I mean, for example, um, I often get customers that will come into the shop and um, will say, "Oh, I don't drink that whiskey, or I don't drink that spirit. Um, I I much prefer to 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 buy uh, and and drink um, artisanal crafted." Um, craft spirits from Mbongo land. Can't drink that, that's far too ordinary. Um, and you think, well, you're missing something here, you know. And you have to ask the question is, why do people think like that? You know, is it their fault or is it actually the fault of the marketing people? And I think the marketing bods have an awful lot to answer for. Their sort of desire to categorize everything and, you know, put it in little boxes so you have you know terms such as entry level premium super premium i mean essentially these are bloody meaningless terms and you know i'm probably as guilty as anybody of using certainly the term entry level i mean that's yeah okay i can i can live with that one but sort of premium super premium i mean all it really does is is fuel the kind of elitist thought you know i can't drink that that's that's entry level i have to buy premium super premium extra whatever premium jobby um and like i said i think personally you, you, you're missing missing a trick and also what what taking that into consideration why do people think that certain whiskies are you know not necessarily entry level but kind of ordinary and i guess there's, there's two schools of thought with regards to that first off was the perceived way of of, of entering the uh, the sort of the, the whiskey universe i suppose certainly when when i first started in the in the business it was perceived that you started off with things like glenmorangie glenfiddich mccallan maybe you know and then you moved on to the shall we say somewhat more challenging whiskies and um so, you know, these particular whiskies were, were perceived as sort of entry level, ordinary, run of the mill. And um, uh, to a certain extent, I think that kind of school of thought really is, is not as prevalent as it used to be. Certainly, I get a number of customers that I speak to that have gone straight for an isla. You know, they want to know what all this fuss is all about, you know, and, you know, they'll just go straight for a Lefroy or an Ardbeg or something like that and so so I think this whole kind of starting your journey in one place and ending in another is, is probably almost certainly consigned to history and um, so that kind of leaves us really with with one one other sort of school of thought and that is ubiquity and the fact that certain whiskies again like the core range of Glenfiddich and some of the Glenmorangies are available all over the place. You can see them in offies, you can see them in supermarkets and, you know, their perception to a certain extent is the fact that they're owned by large companies that are all interested in making money and just getting their product out in as many places as physically possible. Um, whereas certain smaller distilleries and certain smaller companies are, are maybe targeting the independent smaller shops. Um, they don't want to see their, their products in the multiples because they want to avoid this ordinary, everyday kind of status. Again, maybe that is feeding into a little bit of snobbery insofar that, you know, we only want to be seen as an exclusive brand and all this kind of stuff. Um, but so the, so the real question is, yeah, yes, have we become almost fixated by the marketing people, you know, telling us that these things are ordinary? And are we just missing the fact that sometimes, you know, you just want something that's just a pleasant drink. You don't necessarily always want something that's ridiculously complicated that you have to spend time 
um, deciphering and what have you. You know, you come in from work, you just want to pour yourself a quick dram before you pop in the bath. You know, you want something that's, you know, um, to, to coin one of my favourite terms, um, uh, does exactly what it says on the tin. Sometimes it's a young spirit, it's pretty simple, but it delivers a, a pleasant barley, honey, whatever, you know, or peated character. And, and sometimes that's all you really want to start off with. Maybe later on in the evening you'll progress to something a, a little bit more taxing, shall we say. But, um, you know, sometimes you just sort of like want the simple things in life. Don't you, buddy cat? Yes. So, <coughs> coming around to it, like I said, today's episode of the show is about Glen Morangi and Glen Fiddick. And like I said, the question is, have we overlooked these whiskies um, because they are, you know, so uh, readily available? And are they actually really damn good whiskies that we should be actually thinking about buying and consuming? So that's today's episode of the show, and I'm now on my own. So uh, let's have a look at t today's lineup, then, shall we? Okay, so we're going to kick off with uh, the um, well, four of the, the Glen Morangi bottlings. These were all entered into, I think it was the yeah 2015 World Whiskey Awards. So they've been sat around for a while. So hopefully they've, they've not degraded too much. So we're going to kick off with that ubiquitous Glen Morangi, the original, the 10-year-old, uh, bottled at 40%. Yes, you can buy it everywhere, but, you know, is it, is it good? That's, the, I suppose, the question. Second bottling we'll be looking at is uh, one called Glenmorangi Doorknock. Uh, now, I believe this was originally released as a travel retail bottling, uh, bottled at 43%. Um, no age statement, but the, uh, the, the spirit itself was aged in uh, bourbon oak uh, with the addition of uh, a small amount of lightly peated spirit that's been aged in ex Amontillado casks. So, hmm. Something a bit different, a bit interesting. We'll see how that one uh, shapes up, shall we? Um, the third bottling we'll be looking at is the Glenmorangie 18 year old. This is bottled at 43% and has spent 15 years of its life in ex, uh, ex American oak casks, ex bourbon casks, and uh, three years uh, finishing in uh, Oloroso. So it could be interesting. And the Glenmorangie Signet is the final bottling that we're looking at in the, the uh, Glenmorangi uh, range. Uh, this is, um, as you can see, got a fair amount of, uh, of sherry matured uh, spirit in it. Uh, the other interesting part uh, about it is that some of the spirit is made using uh, heavily uh, roasted chocolate malt, which is a little bit unusual. So, you know, Although Glenmorangie may be considered to be fairly sort of simple and ordinary, and there's some extraordinary stuff going in there, so um, could be really interesting. And then the two bottlings of Glenfiddich I have uh, are, the first one is the uh, Rich Oak 14 year old, 40%. Uh, released, I believe, around about 2010. Uh, this featured um, spirit that had spent 14 years in ex-Bourbon casks before being finished for 12 weeks in new European oak and a further six weeks in a, uh, new American oak. Um, six weeks, 12 weeks, yeah, okay. Not exactly a huge length of time, but obviously that was the aim of this particular bottling, was just to add a, a nuance of different oak character. So... Uh, could be interesting and again not your average whiskey and the last whiskey we'll be looking at is the Glenfiddich 15 year old distillery edition uh, this is 15 year old Glenfiddich but the interesting thing about this it is not well I don't think it's a cast strength it's bottled at 51 percent so uh, um, they've just obviously sort of instead of bottling it at sort of 40% or whatever they've just uh, they've kept the alcohol a little bit higher so hopefully increased the classic Glenfiddich intensity of, uh, of character so um, so yeah that, there you go that's this week's uh, range uh, let's kick off with uh, a bit of um, ubiquity then shall we yes yes pretty cat come on Same way, Right, okay, so Barbie's back for some Glenmorangie. <laughs> Let's see what the nose gives us on this then, shall we? It's a bit simplistic, it has to be said. Um, 
there's a sort of a semblance, I suppose, of the sort of the, the slightly rich um, Morangi character. There's a bit of minerality, a little bit of grass. I mean, it's it's okay. I mean, like I said, this is not the most complex of malt on the planet, and it's certainly not as as rounded uh, maybe as um, some of the older age statements but you know it has a nice crispness it has a nice um, sort of fresh uh, highland character um, a little bit of, of almost kind of caramelized orange possibly um, touch of honey now starting to develop I mean yeah it, it's probably got a little bit more complexity than um, you might initially think but see what the panel's like it's a little bit light it's a little bit on the watery side Again, maybe that's just my palate being more attuned to the higher ABV bottlings. That's again some nice granity kind of fresh notes, a little bit of honey, um, there's a little bit of weight, um, touch of spice maybe. I mean, it's perfectly well made, perfectly pleasant. Maybe you could argue it's a little underwhelming, maybe. Um, it certainly doesn't quite like I said have some of the richness that sort of some of the older age statement bottlings have but it has a nice fresh granity highlandy kind of character so yeah not too bad I suppose. Right okay so let's move on to the door knock let's see what the nose gives us on this end shall we There is a little more weight on the nose. Um, the it's got a, a bit more uh, toasty oak, a little bit more nutty amontillado character. Um, still, it's a, a little. It's got. It's still got that kind of Highlandy sort of crispness. Um, but like I said, a little bit more weight. The the. And, and, and with that ob obvious Montalado uh, kind of note coming through as well, it's again not exactly sort of hugely complex, um, but pleasant. Getting a little bit of a little bit of honey, maybe. I mean, it's it perfectly pleasant. Um, let's see what palate gives. It's a little bit short, although it does finish with that granitiness. Um, there's some pleasant weight up front. There's a little bit of a confected note kind of on the finish, but it's got, first up it has a bit more weight to it. It certainly has a bit more of that uh, nutty um, Amontillado sort of uh, almost kind of oxidised fruit character. It doesn't taste particularly old. It's a Although bottled at 43%, it's a little bit, again, just lacking um, some some weight, really, on the palate. Um, but, yeah, it's pleasant. There's a, it's, it's got a, although, like I said, quite short, it has um, a pleasant aftertaste. There's some spice, maybe a little bit of honey. Um, yeah, Barbie, not impressed. Um... Yeah, I mean, okay, it's 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 a travel retail bottling, you, and you know you never really expect a great deal out of travel travel retail bottling. So you know, it's I think it's not too bad. Okay, so let's look at the eighteen-year-old. Let's see what the nose gives us on this one, shall we? Now that certainly has a lot more weight, a lot more depth. Um, 
a really nice balance of, of sherry character. Um, it's very polished sherry, shall we say. It's sherry in the sort of the sort of Macallan sort of mould as opposed to sort of say the Springbank gritty sort of uh, sherry. Um, it's, I mean you could argue it's a bit commercial. Um, again it's got some lovely uh, lime, orange, touch of barley, some lovely sweet um, sweet barley and touch of honey. Again slightly weightier but still has a little bit of, of Highlandy sort of freshness. Hmm. I mean that is that's a lovely nose. Again, I, I wouldn't say it's it's the most complex of noses I've ever cross come across, but you know it delivers what it does quite nicely. Um, that's what it says on the tin, so to speak. Um, yeah, it's a touch of spice. It is. I mean, and you can see why that whole sort of like you know this is the sort of whiskey you kind of start off with and then progress onwards kind of shatik kind of um, came about because you know there's no no harshness and no, there's no um, weird shit going on as they say um, technical term um, it's pretty straightforward down the line but you know it's it's enjoyable it's pleasant um, you may question whether I have, I've got no idea what it retails for and didn't look that one up but I mean it's not going to be cheap um, but you know it's a pleasant nose. Let's see what the power's like. Mmm, now that's got a lovely finish. Again, more weight, broader, fuller, richer more a little bit more uh, emphasis on the um the sherry but again it's really nicely balanced a touch of spice some honey malt lovely lime note right on the aftertaste it's kind of again touch of granitiness touch of, of of that highland kind of character but again some nice weight to sort of counterbalance that it's certainly not a thin whiskey um even though it's only bottled at 43%, it certainly has a nice spicy intensity on the aftertaste as well. And, you know, it's rounded, it's pleasant, it's, it's, it's a, a, a nice whiskey. Um, although nice is one of those sort of words I really hate using, I should stop using it. Um, uh, yeah, but, yeah, nice. Ugh. Stop saying it! Okay, now let's move on to the Glenmorangie Signet. Uh, now, of the uh, Glenmorangie, of, of these four bottlings, this is the only one that I actually stock. I mean, I do also stock the Nectar Door and the um, uh, the Quinta Reuben. But, you know, this is the only one out of uh, out of the four that we've got today that I actually stock. So, let's <laughs> hope so it lives up to uh, one's billing. Mmm, that's a, that's a lovely nose. Um, really luscious. A lot more sherry, but again, the sherry is very clean, very um, succulent and juicy. Some lovely spice. I'm also getting some rye-like spice, some lovely bourbony notes. And yeah, there, there, is, there is a sort of a chocolatey note. There is a, a chocolatey maltiness as well. Um, that is a lovely nose. Really intense, really deep, complex getting sort of even though it's, it has got quite a fair amount of sherry the the sort of rye kind of character is coming through quite strongly um along with the chocolatiness it is oh, it's a lovely nose that is absolutely fantastic i mean yes all right you're paying for this um but hmm see what the power's like
very rich, very weighty, lots of bourbon-y, rye -y kind of notes um, to kick off with. Um, again, the sherry is kind of sat nicely in the background. It's adding a touch of dried fruit, a little bit of walnut, um, a touch of spice. Actually, quite a fair amount of spice. It's got a nice woodiness right on the on the aftertaste. Um, that's got a, a, a lovely progression. Really intriguing. Really interesting. Great depth. It's it's succulent. It's rich. It's moist. It's balanced. Um, that is just a fantastic whiskey. It has to be said. And um, you know, certainly, uh, if you love great whiskey, then that is certainly a whiskey that you should uh, you should consider. Assuming, of course, you have the deep pockets for it. Um, but. That, that just shows you that sort of, um, you know, what uh, Dr. Lumsden is uh, is doing, crafting some really, really interesting um, whiskies. And, uh, yeah, okay, you can argue that some of the other ones are a little bit sort of straightforward, a bit simple. Um, but, oh, oh, that is damn fine. Right, okay, so let's move on to the first of the two fiddicks, and this is the uh, the 14 year old Rich Oak. Let's see what note goes on this. Cucumber? Um, yeah, I mean, it's. It, I always, weirdly enough, I find, I mean, yes, I know Glenfiddich is a space side whiskey, and yes, you can say it's got that kind of grassy freshness, but. It says more Highland to me, to be honest with you. I've always thought of them the other way around, actually. I've always thought that, that certainly some bottlings of Glenfiddich tend to be more Spay in character. But then again, when you think about it, Spay is part of Highland. It's, you know, there's no real sort of great difference per se. But, um, yeah, it's, it's got a, a spiciness. There's a a little sort of rose petal I mean, you know, 14 years old, I wouldn't have quite have expected that. Um, it's slightly minty, like I said, maybe some sort of almost cucumbery kind of notes. Um, you can smell the kind of, the, 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 it's not quite as richly oaked as you might expect. It's certainly not as richly oaked as, say, the Penderin rich oak, for example. Um, but it's got an intriguing mix of, 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 of oak character. There's certainly some slightly sort of grippy kind of um, European tannins going on um, and it's quite a surprise considering it's just spent you know 12 weeks finishing in in those casks and in that time it's imparted quite an awful lot of character it has to be said and so you know this is it if you like sort of interesting oak charactered um, whiskies then certainly this would be be up your street. Not so sure about the cucumbery note, but it's interesting. Yeah, it's intriguing. Let's see what the palate's like. Fresh, botanical, herbal slightly spicy it's a little bit wouldn't say wishy-washy but again it's a little bit sort of I, I think personally if that had been bottled at 46 percent um it would have just had it would have emphasized the sort of the, the, the tannic notes it would have emphasized the sort of um the the the, the, the different woods i mean yes you get a semblance of of um new european sort of tight grained tannins and um, a touch of vanilla but it's all kind of very restrained um, which is probably the nice way of saying it no no honestly it is not a bad whiskey at all it do, I think it just lacks some punch maybe um, but then again maybe it's it's got its place it's again sort of I don't know how much this 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 originally retailed for but I would guess what 14 year old whiskey probably 60 70 pound maybe I'm sort of questioning whether that's actually really worth it or not I mean it does like I said lack a little bit of intensity but 
ignoring the price factor, which I mean, you can't always do, but ignoring that, it's it's relatively pleasant. It's got some interesting characteristics, um, and um, yeah, it's all right. Perfect doors ready to Okay, so finally we're on to the 15 year old distillery edition uh, bottle of 51%. Let's see what they've given us on this end, shall we? Now that has some intensity. Um, quite earthy, um, slightly malty, again, quite citric, fresh, uh, crisp, white fruits, touch of barley. A little bit of honey as well. I mean, that's that's an a, 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 almost said nice thing, didn't I? Um, that's a pleasant nose. Um, it's got some really interesting characteristics. It's certain, certainly, as you kind of give it some aeration, it's certainly developing uh, a little bit more of a malty kind of character. Um, some nice honeyed notes as well. Oh God, I said nice again, didn't I? Um, some pleasant honeyed notes. Um, Touch of spice again, malt. I mean, no, that's a, that's a well-rounded nose. That's interesting. It's got a, a, a hint of maturity. There's that slight sort of um, oxidised fruit note happening. But what I, I love about this is the intensity of it. It it has intensity. It has yeah you know, emphasis. A bit of a bit of something more than just kind of. Mm, you know, um, that's good. Let's see what the pot's like. Hmm, woody but fruity. Tannic but soft, um, intense, malty, touch of honey, little bit of herbalness. Oh, that's got some lovely intensity. That's really good. Um, uh, really long, and that's that's the thing. You know, sometimes just getting the alcohol level right really kind of picks up the intensity, lengthens. I mean, sometimes some of the cast strength whiskies can be a little bit austere on the finish with the alcohol kind of masking, but just get the balance about right, 50, 51-ish. Um, I think it's just absolutely spot on. I mean, yes, 46 is, is again, a, a good bottling ABV, but sort of, you know, Oh, just, just love those spices, you know, and, and and alcohol just seems to kind of, or uh, enhanced alcohol, should we say, just seems to sort of bring out that kind of intensity, the mm, mad tingling spiciness. I mean, it, yes, I know that's the alcohol, but it, it just sort of emphasises those kind of notes, and um, mm, that is pretty good. Okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show. Well, I think sort of overall, I really think that Glenfiddich and Glenmorangie are, are malts that shouldn't be overlooked. Yes, they're ubiquitous. Yes, you can find them everywhere or certain bottlings you can find everywhere. But, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, there is nothing wrong with them whatsoever. Okay, you can argue that the 10-year-old is a little bit underpowered. It's a little bit simplistic, but again... Like I said, it does what it does quite pleasantly. It's 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 a pleasant whiskey. Um, the the the, the door knock, yeah, okay, interesting. Again, maybe could have been done with being bottled at a slightly higher ABV, um, just to give it that little bit more intensity. But again, as we know, we travel retail. It's all about price, and you know you can't sort of whack the alcohol up because obviously that's more duty and more expense and all that kind of stuff but you know interesting the 18 year old yeah okay um <laughs> exactly um I, I, it's it's a pleasant whiskey it's it's okay you know um whether it's really worth the price tag or not of course is uh, is, is another matter but you know it's got some depth it's very very 
commercial it's easy going and and like i said you know i can understand why you know the general perception was about um these are the sort of whiskies that you kind of go to first before moving on to the slightly more esoteric stuff from bongo land um and uh, the uh signet oh, oh star absolute star absolutely gorgeous again it didn't taste incredibly old i mean it's it there's there's probably quite a range of spirits in that particular bottling but it had a lovely balance it had a lovely richness there was just the right amount of sherry and you know that um heavily roasted chocolate malt just kind of added a little bit of difference a little bit of interest and you're going hmm that's something slightly different. That's really, really quite impl impressive. Um, the, uh, the the Glenfiddich Rich Oak again. I think it suffered from just being a little bit underpowered. If that had been bottled at um, forty six percent as opposed to forty uh, percent, I really think you would have got more of the oak. Um, maybe that was the whole point. You don't want too much oak, but the point is, then what is the point of finishing it in these oak casks if you don't want that oak character yes it was interesting that you did get a sort of uh, a semblance of the of the new european oak and the new new american oak but just stick it just up the ante a little bit you know give us a little bit more intensity you know we're, we're not we're not children you know um we can cope with the with an extra six percent um alcohol um and uh, the the uh, fifteen year old distillery edition. Well, yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. That was lovely whiskey. I think maybe not quite as lovely, shall we say, as the uh, as the signet, but certainly that had intensity. And it, you know, I guess at the end of the day, the, there is always the the price issue is always going to be the elephant in the room. I suppose with um, certain whiskies that, shall we say, are fairly ubiquitous, and you know maybe um, the sort of the blenders, the master distillers have kind of got half a sort of uh, an eye on what it's going to finally retail for. So yes, we can't bottle it at forty six percent, we can't bottle it at fifty percent because we want it on the shelves at X pounds and we have shareholders and stuff like that we have to sort of appease um, and you know maybe they are being hamstrung a bit and um, if you're at other distilleries where you have a little bit more freedom and you just go yeah okay I want to bottle this at 50% this is what it needs to be bottled at and the marketing department go all right okay we'll sort something out um, and the bean counters go yes okay well we'll we'll bean count and we'll let you get on with what you do um, so what I'm trying to say is that, that sometimes you know you, you just kind of have to sort of think well why is a, a whiskey been bottled at that particular ABV and when it's when it's that good maybe they should just say to hell with the bean counters, to hell with the marketing people. I want to bottle my whiskey at this ABV and I'm damn well going to do it. Anyway, <clears throat> that was a bit of a, a, a um, what do they call it? Um, anyway, so all I can say is I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the show. I was distracted by, by the finish there. Um, Signet. Signet, good. <laughs> Until next time, good ramming and good afternoon. Mmm.